This killing was no accident. This was a terrorist attack motivated by hatred in the heart of one of our communities. The Canada we have is one where four of these people are never going home. Our Canada is a place where Muslims aren't safe. The political response to the attack in London, Ontario, has been met with questions about whether enough has been done to fight Islamophobia. That has led to renewed scrutiny over past actions, like a 2017 motion calling on the House of Commons to denounce Islamophobia, a motion a majority of Conservative MPs voted against, and Quebec's secularism law, Bill 21, also faced more backlash this week. There is absolutely no relation, no link between Bill 21 and that kind of gestures of hatred. So what should the political response be moving forward? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. And because we left off there with the, the Bloc Québécois, maybe I'll start with you, Chantal. Uh, you know, I, I found Monsieur Blanchette's comments um, curious, maybe eyebrow raising a little bit, but tell, tell me what you have made of the, the political conversation that's come out of this and and really whether the response um, has been different or or needs to move forward in any way. Hmm. Um, I thought the political leaders by and large had the proper political response. Uh, I, I don't think that one should be doing politics uh, on a tragedy, and it, this is a tragedy. Yeah. I also believe that looking in the mirror matters more than finding diversions to say, it must be somebody else's fault somewhere else. So uh, conversation about uh, Bill 21 is ongoing in Quebec, is ongoing in the courts, but it is a little easy uh, to say, oh, well, let's just make Bill 21 the, the middle of that conversation because I, I think the issue of Islamophobia deserves a larger conversation. For sure. Um, but, but Althea, I, I, and I'm not saying it's to blame, but, but surely it is... It is I, I found what Mr. Blanchet to say, well, it has nothing to do with this, also a little rich, uh, that, it has not, that it doesn't in any way contribute to Islamophobia. I know it's viewed as a secular bill in Quebec, but still... I think we need to take our cues on that from uh, Muslims themselves and yeah. from what I've been hearing watching CBC uh, and reading the news like everybody else on this panel is that it is mostly Muslim groups who are making that link between Bill 21 um, and sentiments, rising sentiments that are Islamophobic. Um, and I think it's up to you know, us to listen to people who are telling us that they feel that they are being discriminated against and that they would like to see their federal leaders act. It's not uh, up to us as non-Muslims to say, well, you should not feel that way because, you know, this is a, a law now that does discriminate. It gives certain rights um, to some that others do not enjoy. Um, and I understand the sensitivities uh, of people who don't like to be told that they're supporting a piece of legislation that's discriminatory or in many parts of English Canada being straight up called um, a racist piece of legislation. I get that. I also understand that a good part of the Quebec Liberal Caucus, the Federal Liberal Caucus here, believes that uh, the reason they don't have a majority is because in 2019, uh, the Liberals had a certain position on Bill 21 that uh, they believe hurt their chances um, in Quebec. And they would like to see the Prime Minister toe a line that is more uh, Quebec-friendly, Legault-friendly, and that's certainly what we've seen. And in fact, um, from his, from the Prime Minister's early remarks this week, uh, where he said, no, he didn't think Bill 21 contributes or fosters, I should say the, the word was fosters, um, hatred and discrimination, uh, but then went on to make other comments uh, that could be seen as a linking uh, Bill 21 now law um, with Islamophobic statements. Uh, now uh, he seems to have uh, moved the Liberals even closer to the Lego position. Uh, Arif Varani, the parliamentary secretary of the Justice Minister, was defending the bill uh, today in the House of Commons, saying, "You know, I just want to flag this is in French, of course, that you know the federal government is not a party to uh, the criminal court cases on this yeah. or the judicial review case on this." So it is an interesting pickle for the Liberals, but in the end, they are pleasing nobody. They're not pleasing uh, Muslims and those who feel like they should be going further, and they're not um, they're not pleasing Quebecers who would like the federal Liberals to butt out. Uh, and Andrew, what what did you make of the, the the response by political leaders, given that that we have been here before? 
Uh, it's a lot of cheap lip service, I would say. Um, it's a little late in the game. Uh, now, granted, I don't think you can attach specific blame to specific pieces of legislation for this particular act or specific debates that might have taken place in the past. But at the same time, there's been a lot of dog whistling, but there's also been a lot of acquiescing in dog whistling. So whether or not it's been, you know, I think liberals are trying to attach blame to the conservatives for some of the uh, tiptoeing up to the line or sometimes crossing the line that they've engaged in, in the past. But it's not a whole lot more defensible in the face of a fairly outrageous piece of legislation like Bill 21 to basically run and hide, as all of the federal party leaders have done. So this, um, you know, we are in a time in which uh, it is clear that there are segments of the population, on the one hand, who are angry and uh, willing, looking about for scapegoats, and there are other sections of the population who feel themselves to be scapegoated, who feel themselves to be under attack, to be isolated, to be without political support, etc. Uh, and it's the job of political leaders um, to lead on this, to set a good example, to be conscious of the effects of their language. Uh, and to be looking for ways to try and bridge those divisions rather than exacerbate or exploit them. And I don't think you can say any of our political leaders have been a particularly sterling track record on that. Uh, la- last word to Chantel, then I'm going to change topics. Yep. Uh, okay, two points. For one, when stuff like this happens, uh, what you're building is an us versus them, and you're actually shoring up Francois Legault's hand on the uh, Bill 21 and making life harder for people in Quebec who do oppose it. Uh, second, I do believe that the conversation over Bill 21 in Quebec is not over, but I tend to think that the court's words on the bill and that first court had very harsh words about what the legislation was doing and how it uh, was created will probably have more impact than any politician coming from outside uh, and especially linking it, which sounds like a bit of a cop-out for less introspection into what has led to this, which I think Bill 21 may or may not be a part of, depending on where you stand, but it is certainly a larger discussion. Okay, I, I want to get to another piece of uh, rather big political news today as well, very different uh, in nature, so I'm going to change tone here. Green MP Jenica Atwin announced she's crossing the floor to the Liberals. Here's a bit of what she had to say. It's a good day. I think this is um, a positive thing for my community, and I, uh, you know, the past month I've been at a crossroads. Um, it's been, in a word, distracting. Um, and so I'm going where I can do my best work on behalf of my community. The distracting piece seems to have been the divisions around uh, the Green Party's position on the Middle East. Althea, what the heck is happening here? The, the caucus has lost now one third of its uh, members. What, what, what should we make of this? Well, it seems like uh, Ms. Uh, Jenica Atwin was not feeling um very welcomed in the Green Party fold and was having troubles with her leader. Um, on, She didn't say it was only the um, Israel-Palestine issue that caused her to jump the floor and started um, or, or vented publicly at a dinner, I understand, with a well-known liberal who contacted another well-known liberal who contacted uh, Dominic LeBlanc, the uh, intergovernmental affairs minister, and a month later, here we are. Um, it's a probably politically smart move for her. She may have a a better time holding the seat as a Liberal. Um, It is not an easy move, though. She is very vocal on certain issues that um, she will find are not shared with many of her Liberal colleagues, notably on the Middle East issue. And she could cause her leader, her new leader, Justin Trudeau, a lot of trouble uh, on that very issue because she is certainly not aligned with where uh, Liberal Party policy is on that, um, never mind other things such as you know oil pipelines and whatnot. Um, so it's not going to be an easy transition. Uh, she's probably going to be like a Nathaniel Erskine Smith uh, MP. The two of them are pretty close, actually. Um, it's a great day for the Liberals. Um, Aside from the, the the Middle East issue, because uh, they can now look and say, you know, she said in her own press conference that the only option she had was the Liberal Party. There, she did not look at the NDP. Uh, we know that the Liberals are having trouble with young voters, uh, and perhaps uh, they can point to her as saying that uh, those young voters are still welcomed and opposing views are welcomed in the Liberal Party fold. What, what does it say, Andrew, though, about the Green Party and, and the leader who does not have a seat yet? And and this was, uh, although she wouldn't go there in her press conference, I mean, I, I do think this is a comment on her, her leadership. And, and I'm not sure what it says about it, but it says something. 
Well, I, I find it a bit puzzling, frankly, though, because if there's a foundational belief for the Green Party is that you don't have to agree with your leader, that you don't have to have monolithic caucus solidarity yeah. on things. That it's okay for MPs to disagree, to vote their conscience, or to vote as their constituents. And I happen to agree with that. So, so that's puzzle number one. Puzzle number two is, if she is interested in speaking her mind freely, I'm not sure the Liberal caucus is really the place to go for that. <laughs> uh, I think she's going to find that, uh, that if there's a foundational Liberal belief, it's that you stick with the leader. So uh, it does cause you to wonder what she thinks she's accomplishing by that, other than uh, the obvious that this is maybe enhances her chances of getting reelected. I think the electors of her riding who voted for her uh, to, uh, on the basis of her being a member of the Green Party uh, might have a thing or two to say about that. And ordinarily, I would say she, she should be obliged to run in a by-election. But if, with an election coming up, maybe that, that's the moment to put that to the test. We, we should say that while the Green Party, yes, they allow people to disagree, uh, Annamie Paul's Paul's one of her advisors, spoke out about um, and sort of seemingly pointed at Jenica Atwin for her position on this. Um, condemning it. So I, I don't know how collaborative it is, really. In, in, in theory, it is. I'm not sure if that's the case. Chantal. Uh, chiefs of staffs to leaders, as important as they may believe that they are, do not threaten MPs with campaigning against them in an election uh, on the basis of an internal disagreement. There's a lot of amateur hour here. I'm going to step back from today's events and say that this was a good day for the NDP. Uh, because they don't have to have the trouble of welcoming someone who maybe will not agree with many of their positions. But it does point to uh, a, a weakness uh, of the Green Party that I believe has been baked in since Elizabeth May retired. Uh, and that could be a big advantage for the NDP, for instance, NBC, yeah, where yeah. Elizabeth mm -hmm. May's sphere of influence was really important, or even in Ontario. So up to a point, uh, I think the Liberals had a good day, and it is possible once in a while that that makes it an even better day for the NDP. See, that's why I keep you guys around. You get me thinking about things I didn't, I didn't know. The NDP wins the day, or, or sort of wins the day. Okay, let's move on to one more topic for this week. The Ontario legislature was reconvened today to introduce legislation to invoke the notwithstanding clause to override a recent court ruling on third party financing. Uh, so what kind of precedent does this set? Is this the way the notwithstanding clause should be used? Chantal, Andrew and Althea back for an extended round. I mean, I think that's the nub of the question here. I mean, you can disagree with the issue, but is this what this clause is meant for these kinds of issues. Andrew, why don't you start us off? It's certainly not what the people who framed it thought they were doing. Uh, if you read their public statements at the time and since, they said this was going to be only in the most extreme cases, a, a safety valve in emergency situations when you have a, a rogue court that's run amok and these kind of language. Uh, when you actually come down from the mountaintop of that kind of abstraction and look at the way that the clause has actually been used, it's a lot grubbier. Uh, it's been used to justify bills that basically beat up on unpopular minorities uh, or that basically justify arbitrary actions of the executive, which is the case here in Ontario. And it's being used with increasing frequency. We've now had uh, two actual, in recent times, two actual uses in Quebec uh, to justify bill or to preserve from scru judicial scrutiny Bill 21 and Bill 96. Uh, and you now have it here in Ontario with a second attempt. Uh, we'll see whether this one lasts any longer than the first one. And what's happening is it gets normalized the more often governments do it. And it becomes more and more easy for them to invoke it, not in extreme cases or even unusual cases, but just because they feel like it. In this case, there was absolutely no necessity for it, even if you were a fan of notwithstanding. The government could simply have appealed the ruling or it could have redrafted the legislation to, to meet the particular concerns of the court on charter grounds. But instead, it wanted to make a statement. It wanted to distract from other issues the government's mm -hmm. having or whatever kind of reasons. Uh, I think this really ought to show that that kind of complacency around the notwithstanding clause was wholly unwarranted. And I, I fear we're going to see more uh, uh, cases like this in Ontario and in other provinces. See, that's why I started with him, because I knew he'd have a lot to say. The last time that, that Ontario attempted this and didn't follow through, as you point out, was to restrict, um, was it the size of municipal councils? Or, yeah, I think that's what they were, it was. So, they were going to cut the, cut the yeah, council, and, the right. Toronto Municipal Council, yeah. in half during an election. Right, right. Um, okay, Chantal. Well, uh, the original drafters of the charter also did not foresee that it could open the door to uh, 
the right to abortion as we know it today, uh, or the French language uh, or the minority language uh, running of their own school boards. So uh, let's not go after them for that. <laughs> The, Andrew is right. There's a slippery slope there. Uh, and it's been there for a long time, but a lot of uh, premiers and political leaders didn't want to get on it, which means a routine use of the notwithstanding clause, which over time basically means you're gutting the charter, because that is what it ends up doing. If yeah. you're going to suspend fundamental freedom, just to be sure there won't be a charter challenge, in the end, your charter is not going to be uh, meaning very much. That being said, it's easier said than done to get rid of the notwithstanding clause, as you do need a fair amount of provincial consent. Uh, I'm not the constitutional expert, so I can't tell you if it's unanimity, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that there will not be enough provincial support to get rid of that yeah. clause anytime yeah. soon, which basically means that voters will be left to decide whether they approve or disapprove of governments who use it for those reasons. Uh, and and the, 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 what's insidious about this is it starts with small things. Oh, well, this is, you know, the Ontario bill doesn't bother most people. And then it gets on and on to larger issues. Uh, and it becomes kind of we just attach it so that we don't have to worry about charter rights anymore. I, I mean, it also, as you say, like the parameters in which it can be used are 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 non-existent, right? It, it, the only way really to self-correct is is the electorate, or is there a, a federal mechanism? Am I making a mistake about that? That there is a federal? No. Okay, Chantal. No, but the, oh, yeah. but the Supreme Court uh, gave wide latitude in its interpretation of how it could be used back in the 80s. Yeah. Now we've seen the Supreme Court suddenly discover. Um, new facts that leads it to different analysis. Sure. And, and, and the court will have occasion to pronounce on it, be it only through Bill 21 that yeah. will work its way there and preemptive use of the clause. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see if a court that can find a way to go from medically assisted death not on to medically assisted death on, yeah. uh, whether they tighten up uh, their view of how it should or could be used. Yeah, or, or somehow, I don't know, dictate or suggest criteria. Althea, go ahead. Well, yeah, there's a few options, I guess, in the federal uh, toolbox, though I don't think the federal liberals are likely to use any of them. I mean, they could disallow, uh, I think we've talked about this a few yes, years have, ago, yeah. the, um, the legislation either in Quebec or in Ontario or both, uh, unlikely to do that. They could ask for a reference to the Supreme Court, but as Chantal rightly pointed out, the, the court it's not a sure thing that the court would rule the way that we think the federal liberals uh, might want it to rule. Um, I think the impact to me, um, two things I want to I want to suggest a flag. Um, the prime minister in response to Bill 96 in Quebec, this is the, the language bill from um, the Legault government, basically said, and he's repeated on Bill 21 this week, that, you know, the it's up to the provinces to do what they wish in their own jurisdictions mm -hmm. um, and basically gave a free ride uh, to the use of the notwithstanding clause by not criticizing it. And I think that that has emboldened um, Premier Ford in Ontario. I, I think it's expediency, one of the reasons why he wants to invoke the notwithstanding clause uh, instead of appealing it. But I think it's also because basically the federal government uh, gave him remission. You know, if Justin Trudeau is not going to criticize Legault, well, he's not going to turn around and criticize Ford. That would be hypocritical now, wouldn't it? Um, I think the other thing to flag is that it really matters what's in the Constitution. And yes, maybe uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien didn't uh, assumed that a premier in the future would be using uh, the notwithstanding clause this way. But that's probably why we should give pause to what Premier Legault is trying to do in Bill 96 and unilaterally amending the Constitution, because words matter and they have consequences. Okay, Chantal wants in and then, uh, and then Andrew, and then I got to go. Yeah. I still think we should separate uh, uh, because they are two different issues. Unilaterally amending the Constitution is one section of analysis preemptively or what are conveniently using the notwithstanding clause is a second. Both are compelling topics that are worth discussing, but the notwithstanding clause does not uh, come into play in the unilateral uh, right, amendment right. of the Constitution. Yeah. Just so we're no, clear, but what, but there my are point apples, is just oranges. That, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah but they my may point all is be rotten that when you fruits. Put the words in the Constitution, they can be interpreted in a way that you didn't expect down the line. Yes, but amending formulas are also there to be tested. It's is all I, I'm saying. This is such a, a, a nerdy political conversation. I love it. Okay, <laughs> la, last, last word to Andrew Coyne. Well, we may not be able to get rid of the notwithstanding clause because the Constitution is tied up in knots with the amending formula. What we can and political leaders should be doing is to at least delegitimize it and to be not uh, right. appearing either to give a pass or to, or to cheer it on. And I do think we need to have a discussion about what do we mean by having a charter of rights? If 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 the rights are contingent, if they only mat, if they only apply because the government of the day says they will, then what actual guarantee of rights do you have? If you're a religious minority, observant religious minority in Quebec right now, and you were hoping the charter was going to protect you, you're out of luck. And that's a serious discussion I think we need to have. Okay, good good way to end it. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your your thoughtful comments there.